Hi everyone, I'm Carissa Patron Mykuri and welcome to this webinar today. I'll give people about one more, two more minutes to funnel in and then we'll get started. And while you are waiting, if you wouldn't mind dropping your name, where you're coming from, and maybe an affiliation or organization into the chat, then we can see where you all are tuning in from. I'll give it about one more minute and then we'll jump right in and get started. Give me one second about the chat. Um, well, while we're figuring things out on the back end, um, we can get started. So welcome to the webinar, Untapped Potential, How Climate Mitigation Solutions Can Also Contribute to Gender Equality, Human Well-Being, and Poverty Alleviation. This is a Planetary Health Alliance annual meeting side event, and it's hosted by Project Drawdown. So while we are waiting, we'll see if we can get the chat to kind of come up and running so that you all can communicate with each other, but um, I will continue on. So during the next hour, we are going to hear from three amazing panelists as they share wisdom and tangible examples on how climate actions have proven benefits for contributing to gender equality and social inclusion, human well-being, poverty alleviation, adaptation, and planetary health. I'm Carissa patron Mykuri, and I work at Project Drawdown as the program coordinator with Drawdown Lift. And I'm joined by today, Dr. Sajida Amin, she leads the Population Council's work on livelihoods for adolescent girls and women, where she is a senior associate and or girl center affiliate. Her research focuses on learning about structures and processes that empower girls and women living in the most disadvantaged communities. So welcome today. I'm happy you're here. We also have Dr. Celine Delacroix, and she, who is the director of FP Earth Project with Population Institute, where she strives to advance the discussion on the interconnection between reproductive rights and environmental sustainability. Dr. Delacroix served as the executive director for several human rights organizations and environmental civil society organizations as well. So welcome to you. And last but not least, Mona Sherpa is a feminist activist and development leader with more than 20 years of experience in the field of women's rights, governance, humanitarian assistance, disaster risk management, and climate change, as well as overall management of development interventions. Currently, she is working with Karen Nepal as the deputy country director and is responsible for providing strategic direction and management and technical support to her team. And she is also working with Care Afghanistan as a de deputy country director program on deployment as well. So approaches to address climate change and improve the well-being of people experiencing extreme poverty must recognize the gender and impacts of climate change. Women and girls, and particularly in low and middle income countries, are disproportionately impacted by climate change, poverty, and food insecurity, 
Yet when they're involved in the decision-making process and action, they're able to push forward numerous of improvements in community well-being, climate adaptation, and longer-term gender equality and social inclusion. So in late March, our Drawdown Lift team published a landmark report, Climate Poverty Connections, which identifies the human well-being co-benefits of around 28 Project Drawdown climate solutions. So to begin this session, I will share a few key takeaways from the report, and then I will invite our panelists to share their work and knowledge with all of you. After that, we'll have a panel discussion centered around our centered around a few key questions. And then for the last 10 minutes, we'll take audience questions. So you're if you're able to, you can leave your questions and answer in the Q&A box. And then we can address as many of those questions as we can. So we also would like to let you know that this today this session will be recorded and we will upload the recording to this to our Project Drawdowns YouTube channel in the upcoming days. So I'm privileged to be here with you all today to share about how climate solutions that center gender equality can boost multiple dimensions of human well-being, particularly in rural communities in Africa and South Asia. So Project Drawdown is a small 100% remote US-based nonprofit, best known for our book Drawdown, which came out in 2017. And we've up updated those climate solutions in 2020 and added another 11 earlier this year. So we are a leading research or resource for both climate solutions and strategies. And our mission is really to help the world reach drawdown as quickly and safely and equitably as possible. So what exactly is drawdown? Drawdown refers to the point in time where levels of greenhouse gas emissions stop climbing and steadily start to decline. It's what the world definitely needs today as evidenced by nearly the weekly climate magnified disasters that we are continuing to see around the world from the devastating floods in Pakistan and Nigeria to Hurricane Ian in Florida and the ongoing drought in Madagascar, all of which are also a part of a public health crisis and have huge implications for people and families, especially for women. So Project Drawdown has identified 93 climate solutions to help to address climate change. And the details you can find more out at drawdown.org. All of the solutions are completely interconnected and we need every single one of them to be able to reach Drawdown. So Project Drawdown climate solutions are currently available, financially viable, have proven potential to reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and have sufficient data availability to model the level of greenhouse gases that can be either mitigated, reduced, or sequestered. So Project Drawdown's climate solutions touch on all of these areas, including electricity production, food, agriculture, land use, industry, transportation, and buildings. And we need to address all of these sectors together to reach Drawdown. So as you know, climate change touch, touches every aspect of our lives, as well as the health of people and the planet. So Project Drawdown's framework recognizes that major systemic changes need to happen in order to reach Drawdown. In climate action, we can start by reducing the sources of greenhouse gases through solutions that focus on shifting to renewable energy, reducing food waste, uh, and loss and shifting diets. So second, we can enhance natural carbon sinks found in nature, both on land and at sea, that remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere by improving agricultural and agroforestry practices and protecting and restoring ecosystems. And lastly, we can finally address systemic inequalities in society through people-centered solutions like meeting everyone's desired family planning needs in a way that is rights-based and completely voluntary and ensuring that universal high quality education is available for all. So taken together, these three connected areas of Drawdown's framework um, can help governments, businesses, funders, individuals pursue climate action at a global scale. 
So I just want to take a few minutes to show you all Dread on Lift's new video that summarizes key points from our Climate Poverty Connections report. And if you're unable to see the video clearly, I will drop the link as well into the chat from our YouTube channel so that you all can view um, with the best quality possible. So I will pull that video up now and then share it with you all. In Africa and South Asia, climate change and poverty are defining challenges of our time. Climate change is dramatically impacting these regions, even though they have contributed less than 10% of cumulative global greenhouse gas emissions. Despite the fact that worldwide, 1.3 billion people have emerged from extreme poverty in the past 25 years, 400 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa still live on less than $1.90 a day. Climate change threatens decades of progress and intensifies pre-existing inequities. It especially harms women and children and amplifies gender inequality. Children born in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2020 are projected to experience six times more extreme climate events than those born in 1960. These challenges along with climate-magnified disasters like the recent flooding in Pakistan, threaten the lives and livelihoods of millions. But solutions are at hand. If we address poverty and climate change simultaneously and synergistically, we can reduce the impacts of climate change and contribute to social economic development. Project Drawdown has identified 28 of our climate solutions that also substantially help alleviate poverty and enhance multiple aspects of well-being. The solutions focus on improving agriculture and agroforestry, protecting and restoring ecosystems, adopting clean cooking, providing clean electricity, and fostering equality. For example, growing trees and annual crops together, a powerful climate solution, can boost income and food and water security and provides benefits for education, health, gender equality, and energy. Similarly, providing clean electricity and adopting clean cooking can address energy poverty as well as improve networks, health, and gender equality, increase income and work, and boost educational outcomes while preventing hundreds of gigatons of greenhouse gases. How can we use this knowledge to address the dual climate and poverty crisis together? We have a window of opportunity to harmonize policies and align funding to ensure a brighter future for people and the planet. Policymakers and leaders in low- and middle-income countries can simultaneously achieve low-carbon economic growth and accelerate progress toward reaching their sustainable development goals by prioritizing these climate mitigation solutions in their national climate plans. For instance, Rwanda has included climate-smart agricultural practices in its national climate plan. This contributes to climate goals and also increases income, enhances food and water security, and boosts climate resilience, especially in vulnerable communities. In low- and middle-income countries, climate finance institutions, philanthropists, businesses, and investors can prioritize strategies that boost well-being and mitigate climate change. They can also advocate to fulfill funding commitments to meet rising adaptation and mitigation needs in low- and middle-income countries and ensure that climate finance is additive to existing official development assistance commitments. Yet current climate investments are nowhere close to what is needed. In Africa, for example, approximately 250 billion US dollars is needed annually to help countries implement their national climate plans. Climate change and poverty are urgent problems. To solve them, policymakers and decision makers must consult and collaborate with leaders from local communities, indigenous peoples, women, and youth. 
by taking action to address climate change and poverty together today and fulfill urgent climate finance needs in Africa and South Asia, we will shape the well-being of millions of people for generations to come. For more information, see drawdown.org forward slash drawdown dash lift. And commonly live in regions that have been and are projected to be most impacted by climate change. So, for example, 850 million people still cook using solid fuels like wood and charcoal, crop residues, and suffer from resulting household air pollution, particularly among women and children. Almost 600 million people across Africa still yet are to have access to electricity. And we need holistic frameworks to be able to address climate and poverty more synergistically. So as you've seen in the video and in Drawdown Lift's climate poverty report, we launched earlier this year, we summarized evidence around the well-being benefits of 28 climate solutions with a focus on rural communities in Africa and South Asia. So as you saw in the video, people in communities who are often first and worst impacted by climate change are usually those who live in rural communities in those regions and particularly women and girls are very vulnerable when it comes to climate impacts. But it's important to know that countries in Africa have, for example, emitted less than 4% of cumulative emissions from 1750 to 2020. So while the solutions included in our report and overall framework focus on reducing emissions, the subset of solutions included in our report also have co-benefits for mitigation, adaptation, and human well-being, which can help emerging economy countries pursue renewable and car low carbon development pathways in addressing their socioeconomic needs. So out of these five solution groups mentioned in our report, we'll be focusing on the fostering equality group of solutions today, which centers bodily autonomy and universal education through high quality, voluntary um, family planning and universal education for all. So for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 30% or almost 100 million children and adolescents do not attend primary or secondary school. While in South Asia, about 20% of children don't attend school. So three quarters of children who never enter primary school are girls from rural and under-resourced communities. In addition, in low and middle income countries, around 218 women of reproductive age want to avoid becoming pregnant, but are not using a modern method of contraception. And I know that Celine will talk a little bit about this in upcoming slides, but in UNFPA's more, more recent report, um, they state that there are around 121 million unintended pregnancies per year. So just to be clear, so that everyone is on the same page, family planning and ensuring that everyone's contraceptive needs are met in a way that centers rights and bodily autonomy is not in itself a climate mitigation strategy. Rather, it is a long-term outcome of the family planning or slower population growth that is a climate solution. So in addition, rights-based voluntary planning and quality education are essential, not only basic human rights, but essential for enhancing resilience as well. So this systems diagram shows the well-being benefits of fostering equality here on the left in the brown bubble. And on the right, you can see the human well-being benefits, both um, indirect and direct. So households in which no girls or women have completed around six years of school make up nearly two thirds of people experiencing multidimensional poverty globally. And meeting the contraceptive needs of women reduces maternal mortality and has numerous benefits. So we can see that this is the only group of solutions that doesn't have ripple effects, but has both indirect and direct co-benefits for all of the 12 solutions groups that we focus, or the human well-being dimensions that we focus on in our report. So it provides direct benefits to health, food, income, and work, gender equality and education, 
and indirect benefits in water and sanitation, networks, housing, and more. So climate mitigation and socioeconomic development can and must occur simultaneously. So the strongest benefits for all of the climate solutions are strongest around income and work, health, food, security, food security, education, gender equality, and energy. And all these solutions together, including the other four solutions groups that we didn't take a deeper dive into today, can reduce or sequester around 690 gigatons between 2020 and 2050. So there don't need to be trade-offs between improving human well-being and climate action. We need decision makers, policy makers, leaders, educators, donors, individuals, all to be able to prioritize these climate solutions that have clear and substantial benefits for human well-being. And now I will turn it over to our panelists, first Celine, and then Sajida and Mona will wrap us up and before we take any questions and answers. So Celine, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Carissa, uh, for uh, introducing me and for, um, um, oh, sorry, and, and for uh, moderating this, um, this panel. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with everybody, no, I can't. So maybe Carissa, if you can um, uh, advance the slides as I'm, as I'm talking, that would be great. Um, so the FB Earth project is a project supported by the Population Institute, which strives to advance the discussion on um, reproductive rights and environmental sustainability. Uh, and we do this in two ways. One is uh, by maintaining a, a library of selected resources relating to this, uh, to this linkage. And the second is by engaging in uh, outreach activities and, uh, and networking. Um, and our starting point for our work is really uh, reproductive rights. We're, um, uh, we're coming from a place where we acknowledge that this set of rights, reproductive rights, are still very largely under-acknowledged. Um, they're constantly under threat and they're very much underfunded as well. So a quick look at, at global um, reproductive rights statistics shows the scale of the, of the importance of this uh, starting point. Um, first, uh, about half of all pregnancies around the world are still unintended, and this amounts to roughly 110 million pregnancies a year. Um, 225 million uh, women have uh, what's called an unmet need for family planning. Um, 25 million unsafe abortions take place uh, on a yearly basis, roughly, uh, and the large majority of which take place in um, low-income countries, so adding a, 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 an injustice equity dimension to, to this issue. And these of these unsafe abortions, about 30,000 result in, in, uh, in death. So this is a, a, a crisis, this is a public health crisis that really needs to be addressed. Um, so we're looking at these reproductive rights numbers uh, in conjunction with population dynamics. Um, so the UN, if we could have the next slide please. Um, the UN world population prospects were issued earlier this year um, and show that we're, um, and basically show that we're on a trajectory for uh, global population um, numbers to rise to 9.7 billion in 2050 and to peak at 20 uh, at 10.4 billion in 2086. Um, now there's a lot of uncertainty associated with these projections, uh, but what we do know is that global population size uh, is likely to continue to grow significantly in the coming decades. Um, and we do also know that this will have very important societal and environmental outcomes. Um, now, there's a, a, an alternative. Uh, there's a study from a research team at the University of Washington um, who showed that, um, who highlights really the importance of education and reproductive rights for population growth trajectories. We have the next slide, please. Um, and basically, this this. 
study showed that um, when uh, sustainable development goals target for education and contraceptive met need are met, uh, this results in a global population that's much lower than the one um, estimated by uh, the UN protection. So instead of uh, 10.3 billion in 2100, and they forecast 6.29 billion. Uh, so what this study really, uh, why it matters for us at SDRs is really that it reasserts something that we already knew, but that continued trends in uh, female educational attainment and access to contraception will hasten decline in fertility and slow population growth. Next slide, please. Um, so a slower population growth has implications for sustainability. Um, because population numbers are one of the variables that influence anthropogenic environmental uh, impacts. Now, this relation between population numbers and sustainability is, of course, not linear, because different populations have a uh, very different type and scale of, uh, of impact on their environment. But still, many scholars have measured and analyzed this relation and show that um, there are positive implications to having a smaller global population size for environmental sustainability. Can I please have the next slide? Um, so how do we how do we connect these uh, elements together? How do we connect reproductive rights, population dynamics, and environmental sustainability um, while acknowledging that this relationship is very complex and multifaceted? Uh, it's also clearly synergistic. Um, when women are empowered uh, and reproductive rights are met, they are more resilient to climate change and, and environmental degradation. Uh, we also know that women act as the stewards of the environment uh, when they are more represented and included in decision-making processes. This has positive environmental implications. On the other hand, uh, persistently high population growth uh, makes efforts to eradicate poverty, improve gender equity, access to education, as well as health services more difficult. And so high, very high population growth serves as a signpost for um, inequities uh, in our societies. So we can harness the positive implications of reproductive rights on environmental sustainability in very concrete ways. And two, two approaches are key, one is funding, there is a, a big uh, opportunity for funding reproductive health and rights in particular. Um, by paying more attention to demography, uh, we can make reproductive health and rights uh, and as well as the empowerment of women more generally, um, we can make these funds become more important priorities for uh, development. Um, and acknowledging these interactions also means that removing barriers to family planning and empowering women uh, must be integral components of environmental degradation and climate change initiatives. And the other aspect, the other opportunity that we can capitalize on that we, we should try to pursue is a framing opportunities, sorry, is a framing opportunities, uh, reframing reproductive rights in this light, in their broader positive environmental impact light can really diversify their moral appeal and as well as their support base and make this movement that's so threatened and fragile and stronger. Thank you, I'll try to be fast. Thank you, Celine. And now I will pass it over to Dr. Sajida for her presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, stay on the theme of women's rights and uh, reproductive rights, but uh, give you a slightly different rendition or variation of what needs to be happen. Um, so uh, this presentation is about uh, some work that we've been doing in Bangladesh, um, where uh, by all accounts, uh, climate change has been happening for the last 50 years and uh, is foundational to Bangladesh's existence in terms of politics, economics, et cetera. Um, we know that uh, coping with climate vulnerability um, uh, it 
in coping with climate vulnerability, uh, an essential strategy for families, households, women, and children is to be able to migrate uh, out of really vulnerable areas uh, for better livelihoods. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this migration, um, migration trend is well documented. One in 10 Bangladeshis migrate out of rural areas and nearly half of them move to urban areas. About two thirds um, of the permanent migration um, from coastal areas is rural to urban and one in six coastal households, which have very specific kinds of climate vulnerability associated with coastal um, saline intrusion, sea level rise um, and reduced livelihoods um, is um, our internal migrants. So in our problem statement, uh, next slide please, we decided to focus on the nexus of climate change and migration and ask questions about uh, gender. Um, this is building on this project on the focus on migration uh, to urban areas is building on previous work that we did in the areas surrounding this coastal community called Mongla in Southwestern Bangladesh, which is also a port city. And we had done some work in the rural areas around Mongla, uh, where we were able to show that providing um, that child marriage was essentially the big problem of reproductive rights. Um, the, these are areas where uh, uh, contraception is very high, um, fertility is at 2.1, so uh, at, um, at, at the level that we want it to be but child marriage is extremely early and that undermines investments in education, uh, ability of women to earn livelihoods, et cetera. So uh, the, the question was, how do we uh, focus on migration? How do we focus on the main strategy by which, um, by which um, families cope with uh, reduced livelihoods? Um, and uh, we chose to focus on Mongla. Uh, where they've been massively affected by increased salinity, but there, where there's also been quite a lot of investment in, um, uh, in urban development in specific ways. Uh, next slide, please. So a basic uh, scoping review of the literature uh, on where Mongla is. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know if you can see me, but uh, I probably am a dismembered voice is how the screen is showing. Oh, there you are. Okay, so um, so Mongla has a few features that uh, make it interesting. It's It was an old port that was revived. Um, so it's a port city. It's uh, it, There has been quite a lot of infrastructure development to revive the port, including setting up export processing zones, uh, which are areas, industrial communities that, um, uh, cater to export-led uh, development. Um, and it happens to be that in Bangladesh, there is a lot of emphasis on female labor force participation, particularly in these export processing or economic zones. So there are these three um, types of investments that have coalesced in this area. And uh, that's what makes uh, the area interesting. Next slide, please. So the question we are asking is, uh, what investments um, do we need in order to create a safe environment for young women or in order to allow them to participate effectively in these development agendas that are taking place in uh, Bangladesh and in Mongolia in particular. Uh, so uh, it was what we did qualitative interviews, we did consultations in the community, and essentially this presentation highlights those um, effects. Um, so there are, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, new employment opportunities for young women in these areas. Um, and uh, the employers, the developers are thinking strongly about ways in which women can be catered to. Um, uh, because uh, the importance of female labor is well understood. Uh, the main uh, barriers to women's uh, engagement comes in the in terms of um, 
women's access to and transport structures in the community. Um, and there are specific reasons why uh, they have to travel large distances. And uh, there are concerns that uh, with though that is a particular hindrance for women rather than more of an hindrance for women rather than for men. So that was interesting. And that sort of suggests that we need to address problems of housing for migrants and for commuting workers in order for um, women to participate more fully. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the, the concerns that uh, that arise from not being able to live right where the work opportunities are um, is, um, uh, is one of safety and security. And uh, there was quite graphic recognition of that in the uh, in conversations we had. Um, and the ways in which gender-based uh, violence has come into play in as a barrier to women's um, uh, equitable, um, participation in the development process. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, I'll skip over this. Um, and th this has implications for school dropout and child marriage, which still remain the big barriers. What was really interesting for me is that in a lot of these uh, consultations where we are asking about what skills to develop, how could we better support women, the emphasis was on development of soft skills because of this recognition of um, violence as being the main barrier. Um, and um, for, for that, those soft skills consisted of recognizing how to conduct themselves uh, in ways and how to take opportunities of safety considerations that were um, put in place by the local government. Um, and the next slide will just summarize uh, some of the main points that came out of our consultation. So, um, you know, there were some basic infrastructural investments that need to needs to be made in urban environment around issues of water salinity, around issues of ho housing. Um, but what was really striking for me is the identification of safety and security as factors that impeded women's participation in work, but also promoted school dropouts and child marriage. And therefore the, the emphasis that we felt or they felt uh, needed to, to take place in supportive programs was to provide life skills training, gender awareness, and then basic uh, skills. Um, and in terms of where these interventions could happen, it was also interesting that these interventions, uh, these programs could happen in the urban environment themselves, but also in the sending communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that's basically where we are. We're hoping that uh, we, will, um, uh, we will be able to implement some of these programs. And uh, so watch this space and we'll come back in a few years and tell you how effective we've been. Thank you. Thank you, Sajida. Thank you for sharing your insights. <clears throat> and now over to you, Mona, with an overview of the Haryoban program. Thank you. Thank you, Karisa, and thank you, Sajida and Celine also. It's very nice to hear like, you know, this whole intersectionality of reproductive rights, the different fundamental rights of women and how it is connected with the climate change and all. I'm also learning. Um, yeah, namaste, salam, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, like whatever, wherever you all are. Um, um, I will start by saying what I have gathered, you know, out of um, all my experiences uh, through Hadioban, but also beyond while integrating, uh, engaging on the issues of gender equality and social inclusion, women's rights through these various uh, development interventions, um, which is till the time we keep gender equality and social inclusion as annex in any intervention, the holistic, the inspiring, like, you know, the political change that we expect for or talk about or think about or aspire for will not be possible. So that's why it should be the major part, the integral part of the game from day one. And if we really like, you know, want to tap on the untapped potentials as uh, we have um, coined our session itself today, it is not possible 
uh, to ensure um, gender equality, social inclusion in any of the initiative in biodiversity, in conservation, and in other efforts also, we have to make a political choice. Uh, the political choice has to be like, you know, it should be made by the donors, by the implementers, by the government, by the people. Um, and until it is there, it's not, it cannot be ensured. And um, when we um, implemented Haliuban for a decade, like, you know, with this decade long intervention in Nepal, uh, we, we understood that even more. And then not just understood, but also we implemented it in a very conscious manner and we made some changes possible, which trickled beyond Haliuban. So Haliuban actually, it means the exact translation of Haliuban, this is a Nepali word, is a green and a fresh, like, you know, forest. Um, so by the name itself, this is um, the project which was uh, funded by USAID and uh, was implemented on the leadership of WWF, CARE Nepal, uh, FECOFAN, which is the Federation of Community Forestry Users Group in Nepal, um, and also the National Trust for um, Nature Conservation, NTNC. A uh, very unique and very interesting effort, which we implemented in the Tal and Chal uh, the landscape uh, of Nepal, yeah? So uh, the realization or the understanding that the polluters are the ones who are very away from the impacted communities and women and the marginalized vulnerable communities are the ones who are disproportionately impacted, including the rural communities without their significant contribution to the greenhouse gas emission. And uh, we realize that this is not fair. And uh, thus their engagement in this whole conservation, biodiversity, climate change related effort uh, or our engagement with them in a very responsive manner is very important. And to make that happen, it was very important that we bring in this whole chunk, understanding the political choice, as I was saying earlier, of gender equality and social inclusion in our effort. So Care Nepal, like being part of this consortium, we had that responsibility. Um, and thus the uh, effort that we took, like, you know, the approach that we took there uh, was sort of a, it's a twin track kind of approach where we looked into the gender mainstreaming uh, uh, in the program, but also in the organizations uh, that were part of it, the different entities that we were engaging with at the organizational level, because we all were also not in the same piece. When it comes to conservation, biodiversity kind of work, people are more like you know, either very scientific or very technical. And the, even the things that are said and mentioned are something like, you know, which sounds like very complex thing. But when we work on the issues of social, um, social like, you know, uh, the realities, social context, it is very important that we have to be very simple, you know, understanding, but at the same time, something which actually brings change in the lives of the people, those women, those marginalized community. So that's why it was also important for us to have another stream, which was like, you know, very gender equality, social inclusion, standalone kind of initiative where we uh, emphasize more on empowering women and those communities who are vulnerable and marginalized because of the structural construct of the society and who are not part of this whole conservation related work. So some of the very specific approaches that we took is uh, one, we call it CLAC, and CLAC is quite famous in Nepal. This is an abbreviation for the uh, Community Learning and Action Center, um, which we also call as a reflect, um, which is uh, sort of a very loose network of women and margin like marginalized groups. And uh, this is something which is very instrumental. It's a very instrumental tool care uses in every of its effort to bring community together, to, um, uh, to, to create a critical mass who challenges the harmful social norms, uh, discriminatory practices, and also the issues of gender-based violence and engage in a local like, you know, governance mechanism or development effort, including of conservation and forest uh, management related work. Uh, the other thing that we did was um, understanding that there, there are fence sitters, but also because this is the social issue uh, and there are lots of natural resource management groups that we were engaging with, which was largely occupied by men. It was very important for us to engage with them also. Um, engage in some, this engaging with men uh, as a like, you know, JC champion. So when I say JC, it's gender equality, social inclusion, uh, JC champions, or as a change agents, or also as a supporters, 
you know, but then, um, which is not just to support these women and marginal, marginalized groups, but also for them to liberate themselves from the clutches of these patriarchal ideas, ways, and not seeing things, uh, you know, beyond. Uh, the other thing that we did in this process is we had uh, this very issue-based partnership. So when I say issue-based partnership, in these CLAC, the women and marginalized group, they used to come together and discuss the issues, which is sort of a root cause for them to not be part of the community users forest group or decision-making level or be part of the conservation-related work and all. So um, during that process, they also brought in their issues of violence, their uh, social agenda, which actually didn't allow them to go beyond beyond, you know, or be recognized as a leader. Um, so we, we uh, dealt with it also, like, you know, some, some associations like Chepang Association, uh, Halia Mukti Association, you know, um, Dalit groups, uh, so that their social agendas are also addressed, even the community-based groups and all, including the issues of child marriage. Sometimes it might sound very funny, like, you know, okay, we are doing this whole biodiversity and conservation related work, but why you are dealing with the issue of child marriage? Why you are dealing with the issue of uh, Halia, you know, the bonded laborers and all. But it becomes important if we really want to tap on their potentials because they, we are, what we are saying is they have to be part of the mainstream decision making work, even in the conservation. And they are the ones who are like, you know, um, uh, struggling in having access to uh, different natural resources and all. And then, if we want them to be part of it, it is very important that what is really not allowing them to go further beyond is something that you deal with. And thus, like, you know, recognize it, engage on that, uh, remove those barriers so that they are freely, like, you know, taking part in different uh, engagements and all. The other thing that we did, the approach that we took was uh, this very JC focused alternative livelihood supports, uh, but along with that, uh, coming up with several JC friendly, you know, climate smart tools, technologies, understanding that there is a established gender role which doesn't allow women and these marginalized group to go further. Uh, there is a caste based, um, you know, stereotypes which doesn't allow them to go further and also to reduce their workload, which has really like, you know, stop them from going beyond or uh, cringe their mobility or engagement in different groups and all. So those are the things that we manage, but along with that policy advocacy is something that we looked into. So this is not like, you know, very uh, different kind of thing, very magical, like, you know, kind of thing, but very basic thing, but we did it in a very conscious manner so that like, you know, they are part of the decision making uh, effort, they are taking leadership, one of the very important and interesting thing that I would like to tell you along with these uh, the CLAC groups, the eco-friendly enterprise that we established, which you saw in the presentation also, which will be shared with you and you can go through that. Uh, but something um, uh, that uh, uh, we noticed is when you have a very conscious kind of engagement uh, and when you make it a political effort in your project from day one, what it does is the achievement that you gain in the project actually trickles beyond in the society. Many of these women leaders whom we capacitated, supported, and trained, and created enabling environment to be part of the community user, forest users group or NRM groups, you know, actually later on, they advanced their leadership beyond in the society, they went through the election process, they became part of different political parties and started contributing in a different aspect of like, you know, community's life. So many times we think that only the scientists, only the technical people, the people who are, who are educated in universities and then with have like, you know, several years of experiences are the ones who are knowledgeable, who can engage in the climate change effort and all, but the power that the women, the marginalized community holds in terms of their skills, in terms of their indigenous knowledge, we forget to tap on it. So the last thing that I would like to tell is like, you know, uh, if we really want to tap on these potentials, we need to have a very balanced kind of effort where the technical aspect and the social aspects are also taken care of, have a very human centric approach, not just scientific and technical, but also trust and recognize the power that people holds. It has a different kind of power. The only thing is it is not recognized so far. Um, but along with that, like you know, have a system, uh, work on their agency, 
help them to build a relation beyond two different stakeholders, um, work on the structures by working on different policies, system mechanisms, so that there is enabling environment for them to flourish, go beyond, so their effort and take leadership. So this is what we did in Hadioban. Uh, and interestingly, the project is over, but all the work that we have done is like, you know, still working there at the community. Women are still in the leadership position, uh, marginalized, like, you know, those leaders that we created or we developed or we supported during that time are still like, you know, contributing beyond in the climate change effort, in the biodiversity related work, engaging in the policy making process at the local level, but also provincial and federal level. Um, and uh, this is what we wanted from day one. And as I said uh, earlier, the political choice that we made actually could help us to yield the political results. So that's why um, if we really want to you know, go beyond on it, it's very simple. Let's not make gender equality and social inclusion the add-on or the annex, but let it be the game, like, you know, part of the game from day one. Yeah, Carissa, I think this is what I want to tell from my experience so far, but if there is any question or a specific approach, or modules that you would like to know and understand, you can reach me, you can reach Care Nepal team, the Hariban team, uh, and we are happy to share all our learnings and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing, Mona. And I'll invite all panelists back. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, I think we have time for one question, and we can always take more questions in the Q&A function, and we can write those out if you have more. Um, so I have one question for you all, and you all are welcome to answer in whatever order you'd like. But what role do you see women playing in tackling the climate crisis? And what can climate leaders do to ensure that women are at the center of advancing climate solutions and planetary health? And this is for either Mona, Celine, or Sajid. Parisa? Mm -hmm. Yep. Can can you please repeat the question? Because yep. I just lost you for quite like some time. Okay. What role do you see women playing in tackling the climate crisis? And how can leaders ensure that women are at the center of advancing climate action? Because I see, I, I shared about that in my presentation also. Things are very simple, but sometimes we tend to complicate things. And we tend to see women as somebody who is poor, who is just pregnant, who is in a subjugated role, who, do, who doesn't understand. But the power that women have, you know, they already have that knowledge. They already have that experience. They already have that agency. The only thing is it is not recognized. And many times we do not give space thinking that they, they don't, they, un, they don't understand. It is not um, like, you know, part of this whole narrative that is uh, floating around in our world. Uh, I would say give them that space because once I've seen like, you know, through Haryuban effort itself, once you give space to them, there is this amazing power that they have. They have this different understanding, you know, they have this different knowledge. And if you give space to them, actually they are the ones who have built very cohesive sort of engagement at the ground, which is very practical uh, solution oriented, which is not just yappy yappy, you know, kind of political thing, but but the politics, which is very much related with their society, which brings change, which inspires change, which brings others together, gets into this collective effort and all. So my request to everyone is believe in the power that they hold, uh, give or respect like you know the, the knowledge skills that they have, give that kind of space. They haven't yet got that kind of space, thus they are not able to so you know that that leadership. But once we do that, there is amazing power there. And let's not keep gender, you know, or this whole women's rights and everything, be it in conservation, biodiversity, or anything, like, you know, keep it as annex. Because um, we, we think, like, only infrastructural development is the development work. 
You know, we think uh, if the roads are constructed and if the bridges are made, you know, if high those high scrappers are made, uh, then that's development. Uh, if money is earned, then that's development. You know, we, we tend to understand uh, the development from more economic lens. Uh, that's why we are facing all the challenges in the world, you know. So I think like that whole narrative of un like, you know, of understanding the development, development um, the progress and all those things need to change as well. And we need to give more power to them and then bring them in the limelight. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your answer. That's super important to note. Celine and Sajida, we have a yeah. few seconds if you have thoughts. I would just like to echo what Mona just said that um, women, of course, play a unique role for um, in the in this in this field for environmental degradation and climate change, and that what we really need to focus on is empowering them and um, making sure that they play the role that they they ought to have. Um, um, just numerically, women are half half of the global population, and if why are they not more represented? And the fact that they are not highlights that there are still so many inequities that we need to work on. And if we do work on those inequities, we'll also at the same time improve our chances with uh, environmental considerations. So it's a win-win scenario. Thank you. And Sajida, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I agree totally with Celine and Mona. Uh, I think voice for women is really important um, and recognizing the barriers to that prevent them from effectively giving that voice uh, is the role of um, outside actors um, so that women can um, exercise um, those rights. Um, so it's not nothing new, but removing barriers is important. Thank you for that. And I know that we're a little bit low on time, so I'll just wrap up, but just so that all uh, attendees know, if you have any additional questions, you can email me at lift at drawdown.org and I can funnel them to any of our panelists that we have today so that we make sure that your questions are answered. But thank you so much to everyone who has submitted questions and especially to our speakers for their time and insightful responses. As we wrap up our event, we hope that everyone leaves here today inspired and invigorated and working toward implementing climate solutions that can contribute to advancing gender equality and boosting human well being. So um, we will share the recording to this event in an email in the upcoming weeks, and we will upload the recording to Project Dreadon's YouTube. And I would like to thank again all of our speakers, Mona, Celine, and Sajida for being here with us today and sharing your time. We appreciate all of the attendees also who joined today from near and far. And we will again send you a follow-up email with all of these links that we have in the chat all of the resources that have been shared and along with the recording that will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So thank you all so much for joining today and stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>